Hi everyone, I'm Nick Bonner for TreeStuff.com. Taylor Hamill from DMM. Taylor, how are you? I'm great, how are you? Oh man, this is awesome. We're here, we're in my neighbor's backyard and we're gonna do kind of like a mixed media webinar where we're showing some pre-recorded clips that we did earlier with some live stuff from you here on, on scene. It's gonna be, gonna be fun. fun. What are we talking about? Well, we're, we're talking about, about climbing efficiently. efficiently. Nobody's getting, getting any younger. younger. And in order to keep the career that you want, you're going to have to climb efficiently, save some energy. And we're going to show you some tips on how to do that. All right. So we're going to talk about how to get the rope in the tree efficiently. Mm -hmm. so we're going to line techniques. talk about maybe if you've got your rope in the tree, but not where you want it, what exactly you can do. Yep. Once your rope's in the tree, we're going to talk about maybe some efficient methods to get up the tree, uh -huh. right? Yep. You're at least gonna give us your kind of mindset on that. Yep. We're gonna yep. talk a little bit in depth about the hitch climber pulley. There's Indeed. some myths. There's some hitch climber pulley myths. We're gonna bust those myths. We're just, we're gonna dispel them. We're gonna talk a little bit about the hitch climber pulley range, some of the differences between the models and the design ethos that went into it. Yep. We're also gonna talk about carabiner orientation uh, carabiner selection and choice between whether you pick which carabiner you pick and when. And then after all that, after mixing in kind of those segments, we're even going to do some live climbing demo. Yep. I'll move, move around in the tree a little bit, bit just to, uh, prove that I'm not dead yet. Yet. <laughs> you, you, I, my camera quality is not so good, but Taylor is showing some gray. Uh, yeah, I do have some gray, but that's okay. Taylor, our first segment is on your throw line mantra. Yes, before, I have a mantra. Before we cut away to that, why do you have a mantra? I have a throw line mantra because I'm not the world's greatest throw line technician. And over the years of contract climbing, 15 plus years, I had to basically figure out a way to keep myself calm and relaxed, give myself a process in order to uh, not get frustrated when throw line wasn't going very well. Improvement, my solution, the APTA. I guess that just goes to show you kind of the difference in people. Uh, Kale, can, are we ready to cut to the, uh, the segment? Can you make that happen for me? All right, let's do it, take it away. When we talk about climbing efficiency, we need to talk about throw line first. Because if you can't get into the tree in a short amount of time, you get flustered, you're using more energy at the top, all of that snowballs. So I have a mantra that I like to say. It's four words. I'm not the greatest at throw line, but this mantra helped me get through my contract climbing career and it'll help you too. So first word in the mantra is consistency, right? And what I mean by consistency is having the same stance, having the same amount of throw line between your hand and the throw bag. So for me, I just throw single-handed. I just pinch the line between thumb and forefinger. And I'm going to place the bag on the ground. And then I find a particular rib here that I like to touch my finger to. Okay. And for most of my throws within a certain height range, that is good for me. So that's always consistent. I always do that for every throw. And I also prefer to throw with my feet together and I stand straight up and down. I try not to lean one side or the other. So that's consistency. The next is visualization. Visualization, looking at the target crotch or the target limb and in my mind's eye, seeing this throw bag and that line sailing directly over that target crotch, okay? I'm seeing the green and black of this bag I'm seeing the yellow throw line behind it. I'm watching it sail through there. Visualization. The next is focus. Okay. You have to stay focused on that target. Do not take your eyes off of it for a second. And that seems easy, but the reason that I drive home focus is because as you're looking up at that target and you're swinging your line here, getting ready, right? As soon as that bag comes into your field of vision, your peripheral vision, your eyes track down and follow that bag and they come off of the target and that's going to pull your throw away. So stay focused on that target no matter what. And the last is patience. OK, 
Okay, you need to be patient. Stuff doesn't always go your way. Just treat every throw like it's your first and maybe say the mantra over again to yourself. So, consistency, visualization, focus, and patience. That's a throw line mantra that I use and I hope it'll help you too. When we talk... No, no, Taylor has not been hitting the gym, uh, unfortunately, but a lot of... A lot of 12 ounce lifts, some 16 ounce lifts in there. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I really like the thing about the mantra. Uh, it was a, you know, I joked that kind of I brought the app to out, but that you went to self help. And I, I think this is like this idea of taking the witness and kind of like stepping back and thinking about like, okay, what am I actually doing? And then like putting a process to it like you did. Um, yeah. Was really helpful. How many people have you taught that to, you think, over your career? Besides the thousands. <laughs> yeah, probably just now. I mean, I remember we had a, a younger guy on a job site. I was contract climbing and, you know, awesome climber, real go-getter, fearless, but just not good at throw line because he never practiced it and never had time to practice because, you know, the boss is always breathing down your neck or whatever. And we just we had a little lunch break or something. I said, hey, come on, I want to show you my mantra. And I went through that mantra with him. And we just sat there and I said, now say the mantra and throw into the tree. And he hit his shot exactly on the first try. And his eyes got like as big as saucers. And he's like, I can't believe that worked. That is so awesome. So that was proof enough for me right there that I was headed on the right track with it. So that's really cool. When I, um, when I was a sport rock climber, I was always trying to do things that were right at the limit of what I felt physically capable of. And you know, eventually I started thinking, you know, is there like a mental block? And I realized that when I was up there, like hanging from the rock, I was thinking, is this a good idea? You know, am I strong enough? Can I do it? And that was really like a terrible time to think about that. Right. I had already thought about it. So I came up with a kind of similar mantra. It was evaluate, accept, commit and execute. Right. And the idea there was that like you would think about the risk and think about all the things and accept it when you were like on the ground and totally safe and there was no you weren't fatigued or like you know in the danger zone and that way when you were up there you could just kind of execute and if those thoughts creeped in you're like no 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 i already figured all this out i've done all the thinking now it's time to do the doing and you know we were talking about this earlier and you said a lot of times it's like that with a in the tree and even like something is you know, you put the chainsaw up to make like a cut here at chest level, like it's dangerous, right? And when you do it, you're not like thinking about doing it, you're just doing it. Well, yeah, muscle memory is a real thing. And um, just just being comfortable, you know, doing what you do. I was thinking about that earlier, just kind of walking through here. I feel very comfortable I don't know how to, how to name that that objective as well. So having a mantra that you can stick to is really important and it's going to be for everyone. Uh, once we get our throw line into the tree, we hit the shot. Sometimes it's almost there, but not quite just right. Yeah. Most of the Most time, of the in my case, it's, it's not where I want it. And so there's a few manipulations that people do. These have been around. Long time, but I, we keep on ahead. Next day. We're going to watch them on the next video. Yeah. yeah, we recorded that earlier. And once uh, once your throw ball is in the tree, it's not in quite the right spot. Maybe some of these techniques will help. Kale, are we ready to go to the next pre recorded segment? So, in this case, my target limb is here. And if you can see the throw line, I've overshot that. I'm up further in the canopy and sort of out on the ends. So if you're feeling confident, a quick way to remedy this situation is to simply pull up the back side of your line and get it on this side of that target limb. Might take a little manipulation, okay? Now we're gonna switch back again we're going to flip that bag over into the target. It's a little risky, but it can be 
a quick way, if you're feeling confident about it, it's a quick way to make that shot count. So here, I'm gonna just get it swinging a little bit and we're gonna flip it over. All right, and there we are in our target. So there we are. Now, as you can see, that was a little bit risky. I almost missed. So let's look at another technique that's much more reliable. Those are so sweet with the shrouded, the shrouded tail rotor. Love those. I love those. Yeah. I love when you hear it. Okay, here we are in the same situation. I've got my target limb here that I've overshot a bit. I'm above in the canopy and out on the ends here. And we're going to use the technique. I hear some people call it double bagging. We're going to haul up a second throw line with our initial throw and drop it into that crotch. This is more reliable than the, uh, than the flip technique that we just saw earlier. So second throw line, it helps if you can differentiate them. I've got two slightly different colors here, but once it, when it, you're up 60, 70 feet, don't get confused, all right? So I'm going to attach the, I, I particularly like to attach the tag end of the line that's, that's going in to the D ring of the line that's coming out. That just keeps it straight for me. I like this DMM accessory lock so I can screw it closed so I'm not grabbing any small sticks and that carabiner gets hung up. So we're gonna attach those together you may, depending on the circumstance, need to hold on to that other line. All right, so I'm gonna haul up on the initial throw. We're gonna haul that second line into place. And when you get close, you're gonna to wanna to hold on to this line so it's not out of control. So here I'm just pulling up and I'm gonna drop that line. Little manipulation here to get it around some stuff, but there you go. Now. I've used this initial throw that was not where I wanted it, and I was able to haul that second line into place. Now the important part, once you get this manipulated the way you want, make sure you disconnect all of this before you haul your line in place. Otherwise you're gonna end up with a giant mess. So just disconnect the throw bag, completely untie that initial line and pull it out of there, and now you can haul your climbing line into place. Okay, so another throw line manipulation technique that I like to use is called the bottle trick. I've got my target union here, but you can see I've thrown quite a ways out on this limb, but there's a little sprout, a little sucker up there that's preventing that throw line from walking back down. Now, if this is low enough in the canopy, we can haul our rope in and use a flip stick, which is a technique we'll get to in a minute. But for now, it's consider it very high in the canopy. A flip stick's not gonna work. So we're gonna manipulate just using the throw line. We're gonna use a couple clove hitches because it cinches onto the bottle nicely. So here's one clove hitch. Get that down nice and tight. Clove hitch number two on the other side. <clears throat> and we're gonna pull it through so there's nice tight line here along the bottle. Okay, and now with that, we should be able to haul this up and bump that bottle over that obstruction. Takes a couple flips. And depend, there you go. So now we can continue to walk that down into the, into the union. And that's the bottle trick. So in this case, my target limb is here. And if you can see the throw line, I've overshot that. I'm up further in the canopy and sort of out on the ends. So if you're feeling... I think that the throw line manipulation stuff is really cool. Like the double bagging, the way you're able to drag the other system up uh, and drop it in. And honestly, the bottle trick, I've never heard of that. Really? really? Never. never. Yeah, these... They've, They've been, been around, around for a while. I think people, people tend to um, maybe, maybe overlook them sometimes, sometimes or it's nice to have a refresher. So, so if any of those, those techniques were new to you out there, there then, then right on. That's what you're here for.
What, um, Kale, were there any comments in the chat about throw line manipulation? What do people use? There's, I think double bagging is pretty fairly used. The flip technique, obviously, I think is a very kind of intuitive one. People may even teach themselves that. Yep. yep. Um, I have the, uh, Philip Renaud says he usually uses a steel beaner for the, uh, uh bottle trick. Oh, sure. carabiner, carabiner works. works. Anything with some bulk, even, even a rock. And you just kind of like put wrap it around the spine of the carabiner. Could, Could do that, that. Yeah. Oh yeah. A rock seems like a poor choice though. <laughs> Cause it's not like cap captured. Depends, Depends on, on what the rock is shaped, shaped like. Yeah. If you had a, say a bottle shaped rock or a steel carabiner shaped rock. Yeah, good choice. And that rock, rock would be a good choice. choice. Okay. Uh, uh, off. Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> Sorry, no. You know, keep going. Well, I was, was going to say, say, oftentimes, oftentimes I, I see folks uh, manipulating, manipulating throw line. line um, they'll, they'll use a climbing, climbing line as well, or their ascent line, right? So they'll attach their ascent line maybe with, with a. a a, a loop, loop and they'll put the throw line, line through the loop of rope and then they manipulate that way swinging the bag around and trying to get it to go and it, it's I, I would caution you against tricks like that unless you're really sure what's going on because you can just end up with a tangled mess and and then you know everything's stuck in the tree so i try to keep it to throw line manipulation as much as possible you know what we didn't cover was once the throw line is in the tree, what's your method of tying the rope to the throw line, Taylor? Yeah, well, I use the uh, I use throw bags with the little, little whatever the little webbing bit at the bottom. So I typically just take a DMM accessory carabiner with the, the locking version with the screw gate, so I can screw it shut, and that just I just pierce that through the end of the rope, and uh, that just gets clipped into the to the throw bag. That's how I like to do it. Oh, right through the end of the rope. I love those accessory carabiners. Yeah. I use one with a captive bar for my keychain, even for my yep. cars. It's good for that. Super nice. Uh, next, we're going to talk about ascent, and then we're going to go into kind of a whole thing on the hitch climber pulley, which is really interesting. Mm -hmm. uh, when we're ascending the tree, that's kind of the first place that we're really expending a lot of energy, right? You know, we get to the job, we load the stuff in. He says your audio is gone. Can you hear me? Okay. Well, Nick, we lost audio on Nick, but when we, <laughs> just make just make make motions, Nick. You're fine. Yeah. We got we got a question. Say that again, Kale. Sounds good. I'll get ready for that. We'll see you back in a minute. Thanks, Taylor. You're a great guy. One of the ways we can save a lot of energy working in trees is during ascent. The most efficient way to ascend a tree is on a stationary rope, be it a single stationary rope or two stationary ropes foot locking, for example. But whether using a rope wrench or anything else, at the core of some of those systems is the hitch climber pulley. Let's take a look at that. Thanks, Taylor. You're a great guy. One of the ways. One of the questions that I had, Taylor, was, you know, the hitch climber pulley was such an impactful thing, but it took a really long time to happen, right? I mean, people were climbing for a while before we had hitch climber pulleys. And then there were some even like two hole pulleys, right? But like what really was kind of the reason for the three for the three hole pulley, the hit, the original hitch climber? And uh, why did it come out? What problems did it solve? Tell us. Right on. Well, the story as I was, as it was told to me, is that the tree imagineers, Chris Cowell, Mark Bridge, Baron Strasser, were contract climbing. This is in you know early 2000s, late 90s probably. Contract climbing on a project together, sitting around at the end of the day and sort of complaining about how they didn't have products available to do what they wanted to do. They didn't have the, they couldn't use the techniques they wanted to use and configure them properly with the current products on the market. So Mark Bridge said, well, why don't we do something about it? And that's when they started getting into product development. So the hitch climber 
I don't know, five, six, maybe even seven years from initial concept to actually hitting the market. So a very long time. And actually the original hitch climber was a two hole pulley. Was a two hole pulley. And <clears throat> when they had it all, sorry, Kale. Okay, I thought we had a question there. And so when it was ready to go, basically, Fred Hall from DMM sat down with Chris and the and the guys and said, is there anything else that we can do to make this thing better? Is there anything you want to do before we press go? And they said, well, let's add a third hole. And there you a go. A little late. So that's the story that was told to me. I might be embellishing. I might be forgetting things. But so, yes, the hitch climber pulley. And I'm just going to disassemble this system here for a minute. But of course, today we have the original hitch climber pulley, which now we're calling the, the TAP, the triple attachment pulley. We have the rigger pulley, which is basically the same dimensions as the triple attachment. It's just beefier. It's got a higher MBS. And it has the option. You want me to walk closer? Got it. How's that? Triple attachment pulley here, rigger pulley here, higher MBS, and also the option to pin the side plates together with that little hole there. The hitch climber eccentric, which I have on the rope here. Hitch climber eccentric is a further progress in the design. You could say it's a specialized hitch climber. You can see the hole spacing is different. We've pushed these holes out a bit, and now there's a, maybe you can kind of see this curved radius, creates more room in the rope channel, so there's less rope rubbing on the side plates. Sorry? Do we have this video? Uh, we're, we're just collating here. What don't we have? Say that again, Kale. OK, that's cool. Well, we've got, done some pre-recorded stuff. We're doing some live stuff. There might be a repeat. Hitch climber eccentric. Narrower side plates on top that helps advance the hitch and also helps so that you're not getting your uh, hitch legs snagged inside the sheave. The bottom side of the eccentric has a wide flare to lead the rope in uh, with less friction. And there's some other bits too, but I think we might've covered it in one of the pre-recorded videos. So going back to the ethos behind the hitch climber. Gotcha. Kale is talking in my ear, so we're trying to, I'm trying to listen and talk at the same time. <clears throat> the hitch climber. If we look at the climbing systems that folks were using in the uh, late 90s, early 2000s, Yeah, a very popular configuration, configuration was something, something similar, similar to this. this. A, a wide top carabiner like, like an HMS, HMS or a modified D, D. And, and you've got hitch cords, some, some sort of micro pulley, some sort of micro pulley. pulley. Say, Say that, that again, Kale. Kale. Okay, okay, we're getting Nick, Nick to do a close, close up here. here. Got, got it? it? Kind of. right, right on. on. Two, Two hitch cord eyes. I splice for the rope. rope. In, In a, a MRS or doubled rope, rope system, system. We've, we've got, got the climber's weight here or climber's, climber's tension. tension. We've, we've got 50% tension in this leg, 50% tension in this leg. This, this hitch then divides that 50% into quarter-quarter. 
So we've got quarter load, quarter load, half load. So the, the most force that this carabiner is seeing right now is right on the nose. So Which is not, bad. Not, not a good configuration, configuration for that. Because that's the weakest part of the carabiner. Yeah, yeah you, you could say that. that. The carabiners are designed to be loaded along the major axis of the spine. Right. And as we move out and load closer to the nose, we reduce the braking strength of that carabiner in that configuration. So, this is what folks were using. We were, uh, Tree Imagineers was looking for a better solution to keep a nice, tidy system that was configuring the carabiners and things correctly. And I think we have a video to talk about that. Yeah, we're going to talk about carabiner configuration and uh, choice and orientation right now. The next thing I want to touch on is hitch-based systems, particularly in doubled rope. You get a bit of rope twist, and there's a way to combat that. One is to keep your hitch tied consistently. And by that, I mean I've got equal tension on both legs of the hitch, running all the way to the top of the hitch. <clears throat> Oftentimes, I will tie my hitch, and then I'll start from the bottom, and I'll simply just push the rope, I'll massage the hitch upward, making sure that there's even tension on both legs. And that's going to help with any rope twist that might occur. Because if one leg is under higher tension than the other, it's going to manipulate the rope that way. <clears throat> rope twist can happen, for example, if your rope is wrapped around a branch or something on the ground. Obviously, we've got coils there happening, just like on a Porter app or GRCS. That's going to cause rope twist. Another thing that causes rope twist is when your rope is rubbing over the surface of a branch. So if I'm redirected over this way and the rope is running across that branch, we could generate rope twist. But a very large factor in rope twist that gets overlooked is the climber themselves. We can um, influence that rope twist for better or worse. If we look at the pattern of the rope here, it's pretty straight. There's, this is a pretty new rope. I don't have any twist in this, in this rope yet. Now, if I just put a little tension in here and I, and I descend a bit, I'm descending straight down and the rope pattern is not changing. It's not spinning. Now, I'm going to twist my wrist one way as I descend. And now you can see that rope pattern moving. Can you see that on the film? See that rope twisting? Okay. And I can manipulate it the other way. If I simply twist my wrist the other way, I can input twist into the tail of that rope. Okay. And it's right or left, back and forth, the whole way down the rope, depending on how I twist that hitch. One more time. So straight down. Now I'm going to twist, push on my thumb. You can see the rope twisting like a left hand uh, corkscrew. And now if I turn to the right and push with my fingers, the rope is twisting back the other way. Okay, so that is the climber inputting that twist in the rope. So it's important to have, uh, I guess, a neutrally running hitch. That's less apt to put twist in the rope and also just watch your positioning. So oftentimes when we're stretching way out, we might have a particular way that we like to push our arm back and we'll put twist in that rope. Final thought on that rope twist. And by the way, it was James Kilpatrick and Scott Forrest that showed me this many years ago. So thanks for that. Changed my climbing life. To take rope twist out of the rope, I generally look between myself and the anchor point. So when I look up toward that anchor point, I want to see no twist in that rope. If I have some twist in the tail, that's usually okay. I can take care of that later. But the most important point is to have a nice, clean, straight rope all the way to your anchor point and back. You'll notice I have a grommet here on the spine of my carabiner, and that helps keep that hitch from falling down the spine. Okay, that's a good thing to put in place. I really, I see a lot of photos 
maybe this is extreme, but I do see a lot of photos like this when somebody's got their hitch way down, way down on their spine, spine there. So just watch out for that. But speaking of carabiner selection, <clears throat> we have <clears throat> an Ultra O. This is a Duralock, and we have our Perfecto. I like the Perfecto. It, it's a little bit shorter, pulls that eye splice a little further away from the hitch. <clears throat> but the ovals are excellent for use in this system. We keep everything neat and organized. We're playing to the strengths of that oval. Okay, if you were only to have, for example, one oval and one modified D-shaped carabiner, for example, like this shadow, okay, this is less than ideal. We're starting to load this carabiner away from the spine further toward the nose, all right? What makes this even worse is when someone flips that over because they want to be able to easily clip in and out of a swivel on their bridge, for example, and you get this going on. Now this is cramming too much stuff into the, the basket of that carabiner, right? And you can even influence the gate right there. You can see it's already, it's already pushed the gate partway. So avoid doing that. If you only have one oval carabiner, then use it on the bottom. So it houses that equipment effectively. <clears throat> Put that oval carabiner on the bottom. And don't forget your grommet. But if I only did have the one oval, a connector like the shadow from point A to point B, right? This connector is designed to keep the load close to the spine, all right? That would be a, a, an okay place to use that. I still prefer an oval there, just personal preference. But if you do only have one oval carabiner, make sure you're putting it on the bottom. Also make sure you're connecting the hitch eyes to the bottom hole of the hitch climber. You get the most benefit out of that. That's the way it was really designed to be used, but just think about that. Point A to point B, you don't want to cram a bunch of stuff in here because you're loading that carabiner incorrectly. So let's get climbing, okay? The next thing. Let's get climbing. I'm not going to lie. I won't lie. I was a little shocked by seeing the rope twist underneath just based on. I mean, you were kind of like goosing it like a motorcycle throttle. And it was literally translating into twisting and hockling and like. In the example, that wasn't really amounting to much. But over the course of 15 or 25 foot descent, going back up, going back down, it kind of leads to like an accumulation of twisting, which then translates you're fighting that with your body, right? At every turn. You don't twist, twist up my rope. rope. <laughs> yeah, right. You don't want to be fighting that. You're getting old. But no, you end up fighting that twist. You do. A, a little bit with your abs. You have to position your legs a little bit more. And when you're positioning yourself, I mean, what is it? A thousand times in a day, right? Adjusting, adding a little bit to that, making it a little bit harder every time, that seems crazy. Yeah, yeah well, well, I, I think, think it's, it's, it also has to do with, with um, <clears throat> you know, for, for example, if you're using a swivel and you get, get a bunch of twist up here, you know, you're gonna get this going on right near your bridge and you've got rope twist going around your carabiner like this and now you're you know, having to lanyard in and unclip and untwist it and whatever. And that you're, I guess you could say you're losing some efficiency there as well. So yeah, it's a, well, and, and straight rope just runs better. It just, it just works better in devices. It works better with the hitch base system. So, you know, it's never, never perfect, but just do your best to try to keep it as neutral as possible. We talked about carabiner shape, size, and orientation. And I'm a big believer that it's ovals or nothing, really. And I like oval carabiners because they're symmetric, um, because they tend to load more evenly. Um, I understand, right? So like when you think about how a carabiner loads, you put a bunch of force here and an anchor here, the load of the, of the is, is spread 50% between the spine and the gate. And with the gate being weaker than the spine, the gate breaks eventually 
and it leads to kind of a lower MBS for oval shaped carabiners. And that's why you see D shaped carabiners having a higher MBS. And like when I entered the tree industry, it was stronger is better. A rope with 200 pounds more MBS sold better than a rope with less MBS. And I think we're getting away from that now. We're like looking more towards function, weight, and you know, is being at 6,000 pounds versus 5,000 pounds better, right? I don't know. Well, well I, I think, think I would say, say I'm not quite sure if in an oval carabiner it's 50% spine and gait. I would assume that the spine is still doing most of the work. So just to, just to clarify that. Oh, I don't know about that. I think that's why we moved from oval to DC. Look at Taylor's like, I am a carabiner expert. <laughs> Bring it. <laughs> It's still, well, just if you look at it this way, um, what we get with an oval is a configured strength, if you will, right? If we want to configure this system this way with all of this bulk in one side or the other of this oval, the, the oval caters to that configuration. Whereas a, as a carabiner such as the shadow here, which basically these have the same strength, but if you look at a a, a a zodiac or one of our other Klettersteigs or something that is is quite a bit stronger, mostly because of the shape of the carabiner, um, we're just it's just using it in a configuration that maximizes its potential. I suppose I'd say it that way. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. I'd have to defer to my engineers for that, but <laughs> in a in a nutshell, that in a nutshell, you're correct. Uh, that's okay. Taylor, anything else to add before we segue into Hitch Climber Pulley myths? Let's, Let's segue. segue. Kill. Segue. I want to dispel a couple myths, a couple rumors that I've heard about the Hitch Climber Pulley. People ask me often, is this rated for life support? Yes, absolutely. Is the axle and sheave rated for life support? Absolutely. This Hitch Climber triple attachment pulley has an MBS of 30 kilonewton. It's certified to the pulley standard EN 12278. Okay, so 30 kilonewtons from any attachment hole to the axle, 30 kilonewtons across all the attachment holes. Now, it does say 15 kilonewton on either side of the, seat of the side plate here, but that is because with two legs of rope, 15 kilonewtons on one side, 15 on the other, maximum 30 kilonewton. So, 30 kilonewton all day long. You can use this as a floating anchor point. You can use it in your climbing system as such. One place that we don't necessarily want to use it is on the bridge of your harness, and I'll explain why. So if I put this on the bridge of my harness here, technically, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just a rope running over the sheave of the pulley, right? But where you run into problems is when you twist in your harness and the torsion then places outward force on those side plates, okay? As soon as you start twisting in your harness, you're putting outward force on the side plates of the pulley. It's not designed for that. So that is where that comes from. I would highly recommend you do not use this on your bridge. If you must use a hitch climber pulley on your bridge, we do have the rigger pulley, which is beefier construction 
updated side plate and axle interface. Plus we have the ability to fasten the side plates together with this little hole here. So if you must, must use a, a hitch climber on your bridge, I would recommend the rigger pulley and fastening those plates together, all right? My personal belief is that a pulley is not a good idea on a bridge. That's my own belief. I think less friction there just means that you're using more core strength and you're wearing yourself out. And speaking of efficient climbing, we want to use as little energy as possible. So, plus I like to use a swivel for doubled rope configurations or two anchor points, things like that. So anyway, my two cents. I want to dispel a couple myths, a couple rumors that I've heard about the hitch climber pulley. People ask me often, triple attachment pulley, hitch climber eccentric. Let's look at the differences. The original hitch climber, triple attachment pulley, forged side plates, symmetrical. The plates are symmetrical on either side. And that was a compromise. We wanted a bit of a fair lead, but not too much. So we had to come up with a symmetrical idea like this. Now, the Hitch Climber Eccentric has a narrower top and a very wide fair lead on the bottom. If you are using this pulley in a climbing system such as this, you want the narrow side up and the flared side down. And the reason for that, the narrow side helps to advance the hitch cord more easily. There's less of a chance, there's not zero chance, but there's less of a chance that your hitch legs are getting pulled into the sheave as you ascend. We want the wide flare on the bottom because as the rope runs into it, say you're over a branch or something, right? That's going to lead into the sheave much more readily. We've also changed the hole spacing. You can see there's a difference there. <clears throat> We've pushed these holes out a bit, created a bit of a radius here, which creates more room in the rope channel so that there's less rope friction on the side plates. That's the Hitch Climber Eccentric. It's optimized for a climbing system such as this or a rope wrench or whatever. That's the top with closed narrower side plates. And there's the bottom with the wide fair lead. Triple attach. Okay, we're back. <clears throat> Excuse me, should have prepared that eye scratch before we went live. I'm going to quickly ascend just a little bit to show how I like to route my rope and things to make ascending easier, especially for old duffers like me. I'm also nursing a shoulder injury, but since we're, I'm going to be, we've just got this low limb here. So once I get up in the, canop in the canopy, we're going to just do some low level stuff. I'm going to talk about <clears throat> uh, what's, what's helped me be an efficient climber over the years. And I climb both uh, SRS and MRS. There are many more people out there that could show you tech tricks and techniques and stuff like that for for SRS much better suited to that I'm going to talk about MRS and <clears throat> because I think it gets overlooked a lot but one of the main techniques that I use is called the add-in prusik and I'm just going to tie it here on the ground first so you can see how I'm going to be doing it, doing it up in the tree it might be easier just to show it here and <clears throat> just a this is a multi sling i like a little bit longer sorry nick you you're on hand cam now uh kale okay great super so this is a uh, multi sling it's one meter 30 i think which is about four feet from eye to eye i like a slightly longer a uh, hitch cord in this in this example or you know for this technique and a small perfecto and what i'm going to do is tie a six coil prusik on the eye splice side of this system and it, and the easiest fastest way to tie a six coil prusik is like this just push that bite through 
and pull it back down. Reach your fingers between the rope, pull the bite back through, pull it back down. Through the rope, bite, pull it back down. It's already dressed and set. Very simple and easy way um, and fast way to tie a six coil prussic. And now that gets attached to that top hole in the hitch climber. And it can just live there if I want it to. I can still climb and use my regular friction hitch like that, but I can do some different things with this add-in prusik that we'll show when we get up in the tree. But that's a quick and easy way to tie and untie a six coil prusik is just to push that bite through each time. So, with the limited time that we have here, we'll get we'll get climbing again. Again, we'll start climbing. And what we're doing here with this low limb, just to make this filming easier, is I've set a very low tie-in point, and we're just going to simulate having a having a low rope angle. This tree is quite tall, and this limb walk would be pretty easy with a nice high tie-in. We're going to simulate some tough working conditions there. Uh, Kale, will you come off hand cam? Go back to the tripod. He's got it. All right, I'm just going to send that up so I have it available up there. And speaking of ascent, <clears throat> Part of why I like to take time, manipulate, throw line, get my ascending line just where I want it, I love having my rope against the trunk of the tree. I don't like ascending straight up into outer space. If you can have your feet against the trunk of the tree, it truly is like climbing a ladder. So I just want to demonstrate that here, and hopefully I won't breathe too hard doing it. <clears throat> so I'm holding on to the trunk of the tree for balance, you know, keeping me oriented. And I'm just using my legs, almost no upper body involved right now because I can, I've got my toes against the trunk. That, that's a huge energy saver. I don't have to grab onto the, the rope, the small diameter rope if I don't want to. You know, occasionally I will, but for the most part, I'm just using it to keep my chest close to the rope and just taking small steps with your toes against the trunk. Fantastic way to ascend efficiently, save energy. So that's my approach. Anytime I can, I am. Uh, keeping my feet against the trunk of the tree when I ascend. Okay. Actually, I got a little ahead of myself there. I should have kept tied into that ascent line just for a second. So I forgot I wanted to redirect here. I'm just going to do that quickly with my lanyard. That one of your kids, Nick? <laughs> Spike around the block already. Nice.
Do you have any image stabilization available, Kale, for me? All right. Um, so, so here, here we're going to simulate a low, low tie-in point. point. I've, I've got to work out on this limb, limb make, make some pruning cuts, cuts on the ends. ends. And we'll just go through a few tips and tricks with the add-in prusik. And the first I'm going to start with is using the add-in prusik as a second lanyard, as, it, as you would have it. So let's just see what that looks like. <clears throat> Get myself turned around here. Yep, that's flat. So I want to get lanyarded in here to protect myself. <clears throat> now, if I were making a cutout here, even if I'm standing on spikes, which not in this case, but let's pretend, and spikes, pruning, whatever, I'm making a cut here. If I cut my lanyard, I take a swing into the trunk. Now, technically, uh, it's legal, right? Because I'm tied in twice, so I can use a chainsaw. Not necessarily the safest thing to do. So what can we do here? We can haul up a second climbing system. We can use a double-ended lanyard. I can use my footlock prusik. What the heck is footlocking? I don't know. It's something these old school guys used to do. For, it's for old people. All right? I could take a footlock prusik or any, any, any long prusik. We can girth hitch this to the tree with a couple wraps or whatever keeps us comfortable. Clip that into my second bridge here. All right. And now if I were to lose my lanyard, cut my lanyard, I'm protected here. So that's a, that's a great way to do it. Plenty of ways to skin this cat. Uh, I hope what you take away from this is that you have more options. Maybe this will open up some more um, options, get you thinking about other stuff you haven't you haven't considered yet. But I'm not saying one thing is better than the other. Just just better uh, just different options. That's all. I could haul up the tail of my rope, tie in with a Blake's hitch. <clears throat> but there's 200 feet of rope here. I don't want to haul all that up. So the Adam Prusik comes in here. <clears throat> and I like this because I've got you, this to use for lots of other things on the harness. So once again, he muted Nick. Okay, so if you can see, again, I'm just pushing the bite through, pull it tight, fingers through, push, pull the bite, fingers between the ropes, pull the bite through, and bang, we've got a six coil prusik tied very quickly. That goes into top hole of the hitch climber. And now what we can do by alternating between these prusiks, right? I'm kind of leaning into my rope. I'm still using that anchor point. I'm creating a loop of rope on the front side of my system. So the add-in prusik now is basically doing the job that my eye splice is doing, and it's freeing this up for other for other uses. I'm just going to alternate till I get about the length that I want. Okay, and a good idea here is to put a stopper knot in. You can always take it out, <clears throat> especially in wet, slippery, icy conditions. If you live in an area that gets snow, I'm pretty close to the end of the rope here. If I disconnect this carabiner and this add-in prusik decided to slip, it just runs into the stopper knot instead. Okay, but now I can take this, for example, if I'm gonna cut the top out here and I want this high point for positioning, okay, I can just clip back with the add-in prusik a little bit lower in the tree or higher wherever I wanna put it. <clears throat> Okay, now, and in that case, there still might be a little bit of an adjustment, but I'm not going to swing back into the trunk. 
So because I don't want to make that adjustment, <laughs> I'll give you an example up here. Let's put it in the same spot. Okay, maybe I want my lanyard up a little higher. It's just for, for fun. All right, so here's my positioning. I'm making the cut here. I cut the lanyard and I just only fall that far, right? <clears throat> that wasn't very much fun, but I didn't hit the ground, okay? And now it's easy for me to get back to where I was. And when you use, whoop, how's my audio, Kale? Is it still loud and clear? I feel like I'm projecting a lot and I should just talk more at a normal, normal tone. Okay, good. Thanks. Thanks, Nick. I appreciate that. <laughs> One thing about using the add-in Prusik is, in general, you want to keep tension in that main tie-in point and just a little bit of slack here. It's just easier to, to work with. <clears throat> All right. So that's one thing that we can do with the add-in Prusik. A little twisted ankle here. There we go. One thing that we can do is protect ourselves so we have two points of attachment here when we're cutting. Another thing that we can use this for is alternating lanyard technique. Now, technically, this is just an extension of our climbing line. It's not a standalone lanyard per se, <clears throat> but I could add another add in Prusik and we'll, we'll maybe get to that if we have time. But in this case, I have a flat rope angle. I need to continue climbing up this stem. And I'm going to do that by alternating with the add in Prusik and my lanyard. Instead of just disconnecting the lanyard and holding on, hoping I don't slip. So, what I like to do in that case, I'll use this leg of rope, the add in Prusik. I'll put it where my lanyard is now. And then I will move my lanyard up because it's a little bit easier to adjust the lanyard to, to pull myself closer to the limb. So here I've disconnected. If I do have a slip, I know I'll be protected. So I'm going to then move the lanyard up to the next position. Okay, I can leave this connected if I want to. And now tightening up to that next position. And I can do the same thing over and over and over again. And if I don't want to use this, I can leave it connected or I can just let it hang there because I'm tied in completely secure here with a stopper knot into my main anchor point. <clears throat> so again, and if I need to shorten this up, if I'm getting, getting a little too much slack here, which actually it doesn't look too bad, I can always untie the stopper knot and make adjustments and continue continue climbing up this stem. So a excellent, an excellent way to use the add-in Prusik that way. And again, even coming back down, which I'm gonna do so I can, I can show the next, next thing. So here, even though I'm holding on, of course I'm holding on, but if something were to go wrong, I would be um, caught by that, by that front end of line. <clears throat> Let's, I'm going to try to give a good example here. It's a little short, but we're going to do our best. So I'm going to hunker down a little bit lower. We're going to, <clears throat> we're going to put in this add-in Prusik. I'm going to give myself a little more rope. So, you know, always I can just settle right back in, put another stopper knot in here. Of course, if you're feeling confident with your rope, it's not too wet, you know, feel free to do what you want. I like to put a stopper knot in. It just gives me peace of mind. Now, use your imaginations and pretend this is a long featureless stem. We don't have any of these other branches in the way. And I've got a crotch up there that I need to get to. So I could put foot straps on here. I could do the bear hug thing. Or what I like to do with that 
front end of that line with the add in Prusik, throw bag, and I can toss up and over that next limb I want to get to. Okay, it's not long enough. I'm going to give myself some more length. <clears throat> Kale says he's got you again, Nick. Did you want to say something? Uh, we can't hear you, Nick, but basically what Nick is saying, there you go. Now he's got him. Because I think this is really cool. And as a big proponent of SRT, one of the things that I always struggled with is advancing my tie-in. And DRT has always kind of excelled in advancing your tie-in. But the way you're doing it here, while still maintaining the original tie-in, is so cool. And I think it really highlights the versatility of DRT or as the kids call it, MRS. Uh, and I, you know, as, in certain ways, SRT can't match the mobility of what you're showing here. Just can't. Sure. I think that each, you know, each technique obviously has its shining points and some hangups as well. You know, I mean, obviously doubled rope when you're going around redirects and things, you've got added friction and stuff. So, you know, there's ways obviously to advance your line SRS, but I'll leave that to the to the SRS pros, right? That's not my wheelhouse. This is my, I guess my wheelhouse. But anyway, what I've done, I, I took that loop on the front here, threw that up and over that lead, okay? And considering that that lead is strong enough to hold me, <laughs> what, <laughs> what I can do now, because this is a six coil Prusik, I can basically temporarily abandon that primary tie in point, right? And I can shift that add in Prusik to the other side. I hope that's coming clear, coming through clearly on the, on the video there. But I'm just creating slack now from that main tie in point, And now I can. I mean, I'm confident in this branch. I've been hanging out on it all day, right? I can disconnect my lanyard if necessary. And now I can body thrust my way up this featureless stem to get to that tie-in point where I'm able to put in my redirect or put in another system. <clears throat> that would also benefit me should I just need that tie-in point temporarily. I got one cut to make out here and I'm not benefiting from that main tie-in point, then I can I can simply move over short distances. I don't like to do this over longer distances, but I can work out here just hanging on that. Because <clears throat> this is uh this is just an old English Prusik, this is just an old split tail system that I'm climbing on now. Wonderful way to make a temporary and retrievable redirect. Sorry, say again, Nick. Okay, yeah, we're losing sunlight pretty quickly here, so I'm gonna keep moving, keep motoring. But, so there's that technique. I really like that for getting up those long featureless stems. I'm gonna tighten this back up. One word, just because I've been doing this for a long time, you wanna avoid this kind of thing when you're using the add-in Prusik. You don't wanna just be stuck in the middle here. This is really tough to work with. You, you want to be tight. You want tension in one side or the other, okay? So try to avoid this because you just end up sitting here going, what the heck am I doing? You come kind of kind of stuck a little bit, but you just alternate, give yourself a little more rope, get tension back in that system. 
wherever the heck my my lanyard <laughs> just went. All right. So now we're back. We're back. We're secure. I can disconnect this. I'm gonna, you know, stop or not here is a good idea. This rope is grabbing reliably. So I'm not gonna put it in just, just right now. Okay, that is the add-in Prusik. But thanks. Let's let's keep moving though. And we're gonna I'm gonna show the M method. Comfortable in my lanyard here, but act <laughs> the M method. And and two, you know, I could just disconnect this. And pull all this slack out, but if I if I did still need to rely on that tie-in point, okay, I can just keep tension in that tie-in point by just ever so slightly just alternating between these prussics, right? If I didn't trust this limb to hold my weight, but anyway, <clears throat> just gonna make it quick here. Okay, we're back in. I'm gonna disconnect. The add in Prusik so I can talk about the M method or the V rig. Just depends on what part of the world you're from. <clears throat> okay, we are losing sunlight. I'm gonna I'm gonna motor. I want to work my way out on this limb. I could throw a redirect up there. Totally fine. I could tie in another system if I had a really long lanyard. I could use that single rope technique, bang, I could drop a redirect through there and go out on this limb. All perfectly great options. What I'm gonna do, yeah, that's true. The whole, what Nick just mentioned was that, you know, the whole, the whole idea here is that, yeah, I'm working with a really flat angle. So these are techniques where you're exposed, you're out in the open and um, with, a, with a flat rope angle. I mean, you don't have to, you can use them with a good rope angle too, it's great. But anyway, so yeah, that flat rope angle wouldn't allow me to do much work in an efficient manner out on this extended limb. So I'm going to, um, put in a pulley saver here. All right. <clears throat> Create some slack. If we have time, I'll show you where the add-in Prusik can help here. Don't drop your rope. Tie a knot. Clip it on if you're if you're worried about dropping this, because that would not be good. That goes into the pulley saver and back where it came from. So now I've got a triangle. I need to pull this top leg down into the top hole of the hitch climber. And I'm going to use another hitch climber to do that because that A is less friction here and B, I have attachment holes to use for the add-in Prusik again. So now, you can maybe see as I relax into this, that, that force, those vectors actually picking this limb up, you know, which we, we notice that when we put in redirects and things too. So, but think about that. You're also changing, changing the way this limb is being loaded. But, <clears throat> so I'm going to release my lanyard now. And I can move within a certain radius here without even without even touching the friction hitch, I can, you know, use the tree, I can use the top leg of this rope. And if I, now if I want to extend my range, I can simply thumb and forefinger on the hitch and I can, and this is where the pulley savers, the hitch climber here all make a difference because the less friction I have at those tie-in points, the more efficiently I'm able to work out here, I don't have to struggle that much. So you can see the benefit of that redirect is helping me here out on this limb. And we can lanyard in and make, make some imaginary cuts here. Okay, so 
That is the M method. Two tie-in points, only one system, one hitch. So if I cut any of these, that system's gone, right? So you need to be careful that this doesn't constitute two systems to cut with, for example. <clears throat> Although you can probably, unless, <laughs> unless you put in an add-in prusik, in which, and in which case uh, you could, well, you'd have to have two add-in prusiks. We can talk about that later, but questions, anybody? We're probably going to wrap sometime in the next 10 minutes. Can you leave the anchors in place? Yeah, I'll leave the anchors in place. I guess the video is getting hard to see here. I just wanted to, to talk about moving briefly with the M method and that <clears throat> you can pull yourself in a bit here, take out the slack here, right? You don't always wanna just pull the slack here first. Sometimes it's to your advantage and efficient to pull yourself into that second tie-in point first and then tighten up that system. So as you mess around with it, uh, you'll find some I don't know, little things that just make your life easier. And so as I'm coming back in from this from this limb, I'm just going to take one grab here and take out that slack. And then I can let myself down slowly, just using hand pressure into the middle. So that this will always try to equalize you. If you have the same amount of friction on each anchor point, this will tend to equalize you in the middle. So sometimes you're going to be struggling maybe to hold this position. And that's where the add-in Prusik also comes in handy when you're in the V-Rig. <clears throat> Very briefly, too, before I hit the ground, I'll tighten this up a bit. And the tighter this gets, the flatter this angle is, the more pressure, the more tension we're placing on these anchor points. So you need to be careful when you're tying into smaller stuff in the periphery. But, you know, being able to maneuver back and forth, just kind of like, um, like, a, like a traverse system, right? I can traverse back and forth here, just pulling on that top leg of line, get untangled. Right, that's, an, that's a pretty small expanse there. So we'll come down and we'll show a couple last little bits on the ground here. But <clears throat> you can see with one, you know, one hand, I can easily move around. And I guess I'll show this too. Like, you know, I can move within a certain radius here on this limb without even touching the Prusik, you know, I'm, I'm stable, it's triangulated, moving without touching the system other than to maybe just help pull myself across. <clears throat> and then as we descend, I'm just going to swing out this way. And maybe we can get a close up then of the add-in Prusik here where if I needed, spin around. That'll look good for the camera. <clears throat> okay, so add in Prusik. <clears throat> Try not to breathe too heavily here, but it's efficient climbing, right? So again, one, two, three, quick six coil Prusik. Bang, that's in. Now I have a progress capture that as I work this way, it advances the hitch. And as I swing the other way, it catches 
my progress. All right, this is also helpful if I wanted to utilize this tie-in point only and I wanted to create some slack in my main tie-in point, I can easily do that. So now, right, slack there, I've got this system, I can climb temporarily. I don't wanna move too much. I'm out of frame now. <laughs> Whoa, boy, webinars are hard. Just <laughs> Add in Prusik there for progress capture and to create a temporary system. Same thing, it's easy to swap the other direction. If you are doing that long traverse back across the canopy, it's just, it's just a few twists of rope and you're back on the other side. One, two, three. Can you hear me now, Kale? Okay, so quick to set it up that way. And in this case here, I am connected. I'm going to generate some slack here. I'm gonna put in a stop or not. So I'm secure and now I can disconnect and I can also retrieve that pulley saver without having to lanyard in if I don't want to. Am I in frame? <laughs> yeah, so, you know, tied in here, stop or not, all good. I can release that pulley saver. <clears throat> all good. And now I'm back to getting things tidied up. I mean, if I wanted to descend out of the tree right now, of course I just could, but let's just get things tidied up. So if I was up in the tree and needed to get back to a normal work positioning system here, then I would just alternate between prussics until everything came back together. In this case, don't need to do that because I'm standing on the ground. Or imagine I'm lanyarded in up in the tree. One, two, three, that's done. Tidy that up. And there you go, we're back to normal. You are a master of your craft. Well, well, thanks, Nick. I appreciate, I appreciate that. I'm not ashamed to admit it. Taylor would never admit it, but mm. uh, we really are the best at this, Taylor. You, <laughs> Kale, me, the Arbor Jet guys. I mean, like, in I always love of, working with you. No, in terms of bringing real, meaningful, live educational content to Arborists, you have been a cornerstone of our webinar program over the years. We couldn't have grown it without you. Uh, it's been awesome. We've had our bumps in the road. There have been some technical difficulties, but Kale, the guy running the sticks, uh, absolutely brilliant, making it happen for us. Um, I'm really excited. We filmed a ton of stuff today that we haven't gotten to show yet. We're going to have some extra segments, some I'm Taylor Hamill for DMM on the Tree Stuff channel. He's stealing my intro, right? Uh, but we're going to have some more content like that coming up. Is there anything else we want to talk about before we wrap? Boy. Kale's, Kale's got, got some, some questions, questions, but before, before that, that oh. I'm going to say, say um, hey, thanks, thanks everybody, everybody for tuning in. in. I've, I've done, done this presentation a lot. If you've seen, seen it before, I hope you still got something out of it or caught something new. new. And really, really appre totally appreciate Nick and Kale, Kale everybody at Tree Stuff. It's been awesome to work with. We'll, we'll continue, continue that down the road, I'm sure. We were just talking earlier 
about how in another 10 years we'll have been doing this together for 20 years. Right? Because Taylor and I have literally been almost like we're coming up on 10 years of it's wild of doing this stuff together. And honestly, man, when I got into the tree industry, I was watching you on YouTube. You oh, were like, dear. there was like a whole fanboy moment for me for many years. <laughs> I'm still a little fanboy with you, but yeah. like, well, I was watching Hitch Climber's Guide to the Galaxy and those like original core videos that you did. And it was you and Reg and like well, well, David Driver. That was, that was YouTube. It was you, Reg, and David Driver. And then I came along and Bixler and some of those other guys at the beginning, August, right? But it yeah, was you. those are some names, yeah. It was you and Reg. Well, well I, I, I was already standing, standing on the shoulders of, of, of some giants, giants so. so. Yeah, but those people are old. They're basically dead now. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's all good. Those guys uh, are on Medicare. I'm, ha I'm, I'm happy to keep um, to keep doing to keep this. Doing this uh, and, and yeah, yeah, yeah let's keep going. Kale, questions? Okay, our questions. <clears throat> uh, first keep one. tight. We're running out of light. Yep, first one I have here um, I, is how about... Uh, climbing with higher body weight, uh, will this technique uh, work for heavier people as well? I'm going to take this one. All of these techniques are going to work better and be more impactful for you the less fit that you are or the heavier that you are. <laughs> Absolutely. As evidenced. 100%. Right? Like a guy <laughs> like. Well, Nick, your phone. Left again. Your your phone is dead for some reason. Yeah, no, I, I don't know if you heard what Nick was saying, but no, these uh, techniques absolutely. You know, it, about about climbing efficiently. You know, when I first started, when I was in my twenties, I was indestructible. You know, I just you could bounce a dump truck off of me, and I just would have got up and and climbed again the next day. Uh, but, you know, you know like, like I said, I've got a nagging shoulder injury. I'm not as in good of shape. I'm riding a desk now instead of climbing trees all the time. But these techniques helped me throughout my contract climbing career, and they still help me climb now, you know, setting up competitions and doing webinars like this. So definitely, they're useful for anybody. I just have bad genetics. I don't have any excuses. <laughs> Next question. Uh, I've got one here uh, asking, when is Hitch Climber's Guide to the Canopies Part 2 and 3 coming out? <laughs> this is it. You just watched yeah. it. You just watched it. Yeah. Undetermined. Next question. Uh, yeah, that, David, that, just keep, leave that. Yeah, undetermined. Yeah. Uh, David McDowell was asking if you have any new DMM gear that you want to tease us with. I know about some new DMM gear. We, we're not allowed to talk about those things, though. Yeah, yeah, we can't, can't, can't talk, talk about them. I'm sorry. You didn't um, tell me. <laughs> All right. No, and, and unfortunately, unfortunately yeah, I, don't I don't have any of the new gear, gear with, with me today. today. So, so that, that was, was kind of a little teaser, kind of anticlimactic teaser. I just yeah, teased. I just teased. I mimographed some teasing. Yeah, it's all good. It, we leaked that. We do have a harness coming. Oh. I don't know when, but, you know, that was leaked a while ago. And, uh, you know, some, some, some other, 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 other cool stuff, I'm sure. Um, I'm not saying when, because I get in trouble if I say when, but we do have some cool stuff coming in the pipeline. In a year that starts with a two. With a two. Yeah. Okay, next question. Um, the only other thing I have is what's the Tree Motion Pro like? Is that what you're wearing now? Uh, I'm wearing the Evo. Evo. Yep. yep. I, I, don't I don't have the Pro. pro. I have a Pro. I, I just it. haven't done a video on it. Uh, but yeah, opinions to come. All right. Not yet. Perfect. We're not there yet. Okay. Is that uh, it? That is it. Can we do? Can we just do like one little segment, like maybe a like either ors? Kale, you could probably ask us some either ors, right? Uh, I'll start. Would you rather, if you had to spend the whole day, would you rather eat cheesecake or apple pie? Just, do, do I, I get, get ice cream, cream with the apple no, no, pie? No, no, no. You get to eat one thing all day. Is it cheesecake or apple pie? Cheesecake. cheesecake. All right. All right. You know, you asked me one. Since Kim Kale you, comes up with one for both of us. <laughs> I ask you one. Uh, I didn't prep for this. Would you rather win a Grammy or an Oscar? Is, Is the Grammy, Grammy for music? music? Yeah. Well, then, then I'd, I'd rather, rather win a Grammy. Grammy. Okay. You know, you asked me one. Now you asked me one. Oh, man. Would, Would you rather go swimming in a, a dirty, dirty river? river. Ooh, probably not that. Or roll through 
a septic, septic field. field. Ooh, so I'm from Cleveland, so my definition of a dirty river is probably different than some people's. <laughs> but definitely swim in a dirty river because like a dirty river might have poo in it, but a septic field definitely. Yeah, definitely does. Kale, you got some either ors for both of us? Um yeah, let's do um Oh, I don't know. Waiting on an either or. DMM Keanu or uh it's kicking me out. Uh, would you rather have a Keanu or an impact block with you if that was the only device that you could take into the tree? A Keanu, because you can use the Keanu to lower things if you had to. Okay. Boy, that's, that's a, a tough, tough one, one Kale. Kale. Man, Good at what man. I do. Uh, I, I, did, did, the, did, the did the crowd, crowd hear your, your question? question? Yes. Or do we, we have, have to repeat, repeat it? it? Oh, no, yeah. they, they heard it. I'd, I'd say, say, I'd say a Keanu because it's, it's a little more versatile. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Do you think if me and you slammed our helmets into each other repeatedly until one of us passed out, that it would be you or me that passed out first? Ooh. Uh, well, well, based, based on, on the helmet, helmet I, don't I don't know, know but, but based, based on, on your hard-headedness, <laughs> oh, I'd, I'd probably, probably give it to you. you. Yes. Uh, would you rather drive a Formula One car or fly a single-seater airplane? Oh, oh fly, fly for sure. sure. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huh. Would you rather be a uh, air like a Red Bull air racer or a Formula One driver? Air, air racer. racer. Huh. Okay. Okay. Kale, you got any more? Or are we done? What What is going on here? Yeah, we're we. <laughs> You're useless. I. This is why hey. we should have the social media lady. Bye, everybody. Jamie, we missed you. Bye. <laughs> hey, hey thanks, thanks a lot, lot for tuning in. in.